All right, we'll get started in, in just a moment. Um, my name is Larry Helfer, and along with Professor Rachel Brewster, I co-direct the Center for International and Comparative Law. And on behalf of the Center and the faculty and students at Duke Law, it really gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Anna Van Aken. Uh, Anna is a professor of law and economics, of public international law, and of European law at the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland. And she has previously held uh, positions as research fellow at the Max Planck, two Max Planck Institutes in Germany, one for the research of collective goods and the other for comparative public law and international law. Uh, Professor Van Aken is a very prolific uh, and influential scholar. She's authored literally dozens of publications in English and also in German on topics relating to her research. Uh, and I think her real uh, pioneering contribution that you'll hear something about today is in bridging more traditional or positivistic approaches to the study of international law, in particular international economic law, so trade and investment, bridging those, uh, that approach with insights from political science and from law and economics. Her talk today uh, is on a subject that, as I think she rightly says, is really understudied in the international realm, although it's gotten quite a bit of attention domestically, and that is uh, the title of her talk, Behavioral International Law and Economics. And I think this really will show um, the kind of really interesting uh, interdisciplinary approaches to the study of international cooperation that Professor Van Aken uh, does. Now, she has told me she will speak for about 30 to 40 minutes, something like that, and then open up for questions from all of you. So please pay careful attention. And please join me in welcoming Anna Van Aken. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to be here at uh, Duke Law School and thank you very much to Professor Helfer and to F Professor Brewster for inviting me here. It's really a pleasure and you have a great law school. Um, so i be brief in my introduction because it's not a lot of time and uh, it's a lot of issues to be raised. So what I would like to talk is about behavioral international law and economics. I call it Bintley. Uh, I originally called it Bailey, and then my partner said that is a human organ, which has a not so nice connotation, so I changed it. Um, so um, what's the motivation for the talk? I think there's a research gap. And where is this research gap? You see it in here. It's basically not black, but a white hole. So we have, have behavioral law and economics in national law. Um, we do have law and economics of international law using the rational choice approach, and we have political psychology in international relations. Now, what's the problem? In behavioral um, law and economics, the international is missing. International norms are not analyzed, whereas in political psychology in international relations, basically the law is missing. They don't look at the norms. And in the law and economics of international law, the behavioral is missing. So that basically makes for um, Bintley. So that's the main 
would do that um, because it would be providing a public good. Um, so there's more punishment and more cooperation than expected by the rational choice theory. Also, the reaction of people depends quite a bit on the judgment of the type of the other persons um, the game is played with, and especially the assumed or attributed intention of the other players. And uh, people show bounded willpower. I'm putting this here because those three kind of biases are the ones which were developed by Joel um, Sunstein and Thaler. Um, that's their categorization. Now, bounded willpower, we probably don't find that in states but, or in corporate actors. But what do we do find is the, the, the underlying problem, which is basically time inconsistency between short and long-term preferences, we can reframe that probably in a rational choice framework as well, um, because from a politician's or in a democracy, from a politician's perspective, um, taking a political economy approach, um, there is a good explanation of why there might be a difference between short and long-term preferences of states. Nevertheless, that has not really been an issue. Um, so I leave this away in the further talk, um, but um, um, keep it in mind because I think there are some things to be done there as well. So we can understand in that sense um, international law also as a must. Uh, states are tying themselves to like Odysseus in order for um, um, uh, kind of somehow dealing with um, time inconsistency problems. Now, the second pillar, international law and economics, is um, basically grounded in the broad tradition of rational choice analysis. Um, usually, what you find in the research is that we assume a black box state, and this state has certain preferences, which we assume, like economic power, military power, stuff like that. Um, or it could even be environmental preferences. But it does allow um, for the breakup of the black box states. So, for example, in trade, um, you have a lot of um, explanations by trade economists on to explain states' behavior in trade negotiations or why we have the World Trade Organization by breaking up the black box and taking a political economy approach. Um, so they play states play this kind of two-level game you might have heard about by Putnam. Um, <clears throat> so basically what... What this approach does, it does use game theory to explain treaty design, compliance, etc. cetera. Um, what's the difference to international relations theory? International relations theory has done this for a long time. It's just that international law and economics is closer to the law. It's closer to the norms, um, even though they use the same methodology. So basically, they use contract theory, principal agent theory for international organizations and, and this kind of things. Third pillar, the political psychology in international relations, uses behavioral economics. So they use Kahneman, they use all those kinds sorts of biases, um, which is also used in national um, um, behavioral law and economics. But it's mainly focused on individuals. For example, um, they would look at how... Uh, President Kennedy decided in the Bay of Pigs um, and their biases. So it's individual-based. It's mainly focused on prospect theory in crisis and in security situations. So they basically discuss um, how you decide in a loss frame versus in a gain frame, and you show that you basically have more risky behavior in loss frames. Norms do not play any role in here. At least I haven't seen any research um, on it where norms have been really important, except in an article of Rachel, um, where I'm going to come to in a second. Some caveats to this approach. And that is basically psychology applies to individuals. We have them in the lab. We can control the experiments, and that's all very nice. The question is, can we apply this tel -quel to corporate actors, so to group behavior? And the difference with rational choice assumptions is that rational choice is an assumption. It's a normative theory in a way, like Milton Friedman has, has, has said, we assume rat rational choice. Um, but psychology is different because it really, it's descriptive. It looks how people really behave. So rational choice, you can, as, since it's an assumption, you can apply it to an individual and you can equally apply it to a state. That's fine. Um, but with psychology, that's more difficult. Now, question is, can we apply it to groups? There have been some few experiments, basically. Um, we find more or less, uh, with some exceptions like the endowment effect, we find um, similar effects to, to, to biases as in individuals. 
I would believe that we should also include social psychology insights, um, like for example, group attribution errors and things like that. But all this gets very complicated, so I'm just naming it here um, without being able to really solve the problem yet. Which groups is a different problem which we need to solve and we need to be precise on that. Um, it could be the government as a group, because they usually decide in group. Presidents are not sole decision makers. Even dictators are not. They do talk to other people. Um, or do we talk about the population as a group? And the population obviously um, influences state and government decision making. And um, if I open up the newspapers here in the US, not only here in the US, but it's all about uh, what's the population thinking uh, about uh, uh, um, um, about an intervention in Syria, um, and you can see how that plays out. And funnily, um, what the population or the opinion polling shows is that they're quite close to what behavioral law and economics would predict how they, how they feel about fairness, about morals, and stuff like that. Um, so maybe we should need to think about some kind of psychology of public opinion here. Let me turn to the applications. Um, <clears throat> first, the design of international law, and I just give you some examples. So if we understand international treaties like contracts, um, like in, in international law and economics, one question uh, which was always raised is how flexible should contracts be? And again, uh, Professor Helfer has just written on that in this uh, famous book where you have both written, um, uh, International Law and International Relations, The State of the Art. So in case you're interested, um, just grab the book and look, 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 at, the, look at the things. Um, now, under rat rational choice theory, um, flexible contracts dominate rigid ones. And uh, Barbara Coromenos has written on it, Scott and Stephen have written on it extensively. I myself have written on it because I was applying rational choice. Um, that's not necessarily so if we use behavioral assumptions. There's been an interesting article by Hard and Moore in 2008. And what's the issue here? Flexible contracts permit so-called shading um, in ex post performance, while under rigid contracts, must much less shading can occur because you make the obligations much more precise. Now, they would say that shading does occur if parties to the contract interpret their reference points with a self-serving bias or deem the contracts unfair for whatever reason. The result is that parties shade by providing perfunctionary um, rather than consummate performance. So they rather stick to the letter of the law unless they breach um, than the spirit of the contract, okay? And that causes dead weight losses under contract theory or behaviorally informed contract theory. Now, what does this mean? That it means that we basically have to look at the trade-off of flexibility and strictness um, changes because the weight changes and the, the criteria we take into, in drafting the contracts might change. And again, the role of courts might be much more important, as well as if we want to preserve flexibility in contracts, and that's you have basically two options. You either have courts, which then might be strict, and you know this, but it must be mandatory, mand mandatory jurisdiction, because otherwise you just await, you can shade. Um, or you provide flexibility mechanisms which are very precise, and in that way, you, you circumvent shading, but you still allow for flexibility. So that really calls for a different treaty design as we have it now, because international law as such, I mean, compared to national law, is, of course, much more flexible, much more indeterminate than, than, than national law, and we somehow have to deal with it. What about negotiations? The endowment effect and loss aversion lead states seeing their own concessions in treaties as losses, and they look at concessions of other states as gains. Now, uh, what is found is that their own concessions are usually overvalued. So there's a so-called concession aversion. That can lead to a deadlock in negotiations, but it can also lead to a deadlock in alternative dispute settlement um, in international law. If you look at mediation or, or, or conciliation, for example. So here, the role of the mediator needs to take this into account. So a reluctance to accept 
a loss on any dimension can undercut as well the linkage issues. And WTO has been praised for being able to, to link issues which are not necessarily connected. So the TRIPS intellectual property um, is not necessarily connected to trading goods or services. But nevertheless, since the WTO allows for those linkage issues, and that is what you find in the literature, linkage issues allow more negotiation. And, you know, you, you give concessions, um, the other one gives you concessions, and you should find some kind of agreement. If that is true, um, then we have to rethink the linkage issues as well. What, and this is really just ideas. Um, we could think about debiasing through reframing certain issues. Um, could be built in the law by providing certain procedures. Uh, we could uh, say that we need to provide counterframes. Um, we can maybe reframe non-concessions as losses and things like that. So, so this is things we a good negotiator would need to to think about. Design of international law three, third um, um, issue, which I would like to only um, dwell on quickly. There has been a wonderful article by uh, Jean, 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 right? Galbraith, Jean. Um, and I think she has presented it here because she thanks Duke Law School for her comments. So. <laughs> um, and she applies behavioral international law and economics basically to treaty reservations um, and deals with opt-in versus opt-out systems and how that might explain certain behavior by states um, when they opt in, for example, to additional protocols um, in human rights treaties. I think I would add, maybe, um, that what I feel is uh, certainly there. If you ever go on the web pages of international human rights treaties, um, you see how few um, objections to reservations are made. Um, and um, why are you laughing? Right now? Oh, good. OK, very good. That fits. <laughs> that fits very good. So um, there's one interesting, interesting treaty, I think, is the um, Elimination of Racial Discrimination Convention. And in, in its Article 20, basically says if two thirds of, uh, of states reject um, or object to a, uh, to a reservation, then it is invalid. Now, if procrastination is a reality, then two-thirds is far too high. Um, and that has been a long discussion on reservations to human, re human rights treaties anyway, so it might make sense to rethink that and say, well, maybe, you know, it could be 10% or one-third. Um, and if one-third of the, so reverse the majority, um, if it's one-third of, of the countries rejecting um, uh, or objecting to a reservation, then this reservation would be invalid. So those are things we could be thinking about. I think we should also think about monitoring mechanisms, linkage issues, and courts and tribunals and their functions, because they might have different functions if you take into account um, um, uh, status quo bias, if you take into account framing and all those, uh, all those issues. Also, how you draft as an international court, how you draft the operative part of the judgment, for example. International courts and tribunals. There have been, um, mainly in the US, in very interesting research concerning experiments with national judges and whether they are also, they succumb also to bias and to heuristics um, as everybody else. Um, and it has been done by Jeffrey Hrilinski and Chris, Chris Guthrie. Uh, wonderful research. Um, the um, bad news is that uh, they also succumb to cognitive illusions, including anchoring, representativeness, um, hindsight bias, framing, and all those sorts of issues. Hmm? Oh, um, if you have an anchor, if you put an anchor, like, an irrelevant anchor, for example, you put a number of um, how many states are in Africa, for example, um, um, you, that's your question. And before that, you give them an anchor which has nothing to do with it. So, is, in, for example, a number of 10,000 in a different context. Um, they would, the result would be that they would have higher numbers on the countries than if you give them a lower number for the anchor which has nothing to do with it. It somehow influences your, your calculation. Um, it's very interesting. Um, and I, oops, I would suppose that international judges and arbitrators 
uh, can also be expected to fall prey to some of the biases or the same biases. And I think international arbitrators face an additional framing problem um, because they are party appointed. And um, where again we could think about debiasing mechanisms um, and using more experts, even though experts might also be subject to biases. But again, we could think about um, presenting certain frames and how we admit testimony, all those issues um, are to be discussed concerning international courts and tribunals. Compliance. Andrew Guzman has written this book, um, How International Law Works, um, and he bases his theory of compliance with international law, and he has a rational choice approach um, on three R's, um, reputation, retaliation, and um, um, Reciprocity, thank you. You see, that's my jet lag. <laughs> um, now, reputation um, from a rational choice perspective is ascribed to an actor um, where basically um, the payoffs of the game change in repeated games uh, leading to more cooperation because the shadow of the future somehow that other states will not cooperate with you anymore somehow influences your payoff. Um, the problem which has already been discussed in the literature is basically that if, that if a state has one reputation or many reputations, so is it the reputation different in a... Or does your reputation suffer if you are not complying with human rights treaties, but you do always comply with trade treaties or in security issues? Or does a state have one reputation for being unreliable in, 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 um, in, in uh, complying in, with international law? Um, Guzman would argue for there's one reputation, uh, whereas others, um, like Jones and Jones, as well as Posner and Sykes in their new book, uh, would argue that there might be different reputations. So you might have a reputation in human rights treaties and a reputation in trade and a reputation in security issues. And then also the question is, to whom is reputation ascribed? To a state or to a government? Now, what would, um, what would Bindley tell us? Reputation is a function of the actor and a situation, and I'm very grateful that you, you included Mercer, who wrote in 96, um, um, very extensively on this question. He's a political psychologist in international relations, and, and Rachel took this up in her article. Um, the question is, um, it's an issue of perception, um, how behavior is ascribed and evaluated. So if you think for now, for example, what you see all the time in the discussion about Syria and what's a forceful argument of, 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 of those being in favor of an intervention is saying that the U.S. would lose its reputation um, as um, somehow acting for the common good and, 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 and letting... Uh, happen, what's happening, and it would not be a reliable preserve of international law. Um, that is very an argument which you find in basically all the articles in the moment. Um, but it might not be true. Um, it could be that um, the behavior of the United States is attributed not to the actor of the United States, but to the situation which is there, which is very difficult. So if that's the case, then there would be no loss of reputation of the United States. See what I mean? I'm not saying that it's one or the other. I'm just saying that what, 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 what's happening here is that it seems that we have to be much more um, fine-grained when we want to judge where reputation comes from. And the second problem arising is that interna the international system is somehow noisy. Um, we sometimes don't know whether there was really a breach or um, why uh, the state behaved this way or the other way. Um, so it could be that reputations are quite difficult to form. Um, from what we know concerning this research, the... Um, the mechanism of reputation for making states comply with international law might be less um, forceful, less strong than assumed by the rational choice analysis by, by, by Andrew Guzman. Um, what would be the biasing mechanisms here? Um, I would suggest that there needs to be better fact-finding and monitoring. Um, there needs to be more international courts um, because they can basically, what courts do is that they basically say, yes, there was a breach or there was no breach. And in a lot of situations, that wasn't clear. Um, so, um, and even if states do not want to have a court um, in certain issue areas, um, 
it would still call for much stronger fact-finding commissions, for example. Um, another issue uh, which would be interesting is to look at the attribution which is made under the draft articles for state responsibility as well as the draft articles for international uh, responsibility of international organizations. And again, here, attribution is not very clearly defined. It's also uh, potentially murky, especially if you have shared responsibilities and um, several actors which are acting. So joint and several liability, for example, is one thing um, which you would find in the um, draft articles of state responsibility, but that basically takes a clear assignment of responsibilities away from the states. Um, again, which would impact the mechanism of reputation. Let's turn to retaliation shortly. Um, <clears throat> in the rational choice theory, um, um, retaliation would depend on a cost-benefit analysis. You clearly have a second-order enforcement problem, a prisoner's dilemma. Uh, why is that? And states would prefer to free ride because if retaliation and punishment is costly, uh, you would rather not do that. Um, and you'll find that a little bit in the peacekeeping. Um, in the peacekeeping missions, uh, states usually pledge quite a bit of money, but then much less money is um, then really given. Um, so they are, the UN is always short, short of it, even though the money has been promised. Um, but rational choice would expect that there's really only retaliation in very severe cases. Now, what would behavioral international law and economics think? Um, I think they're more optimistic concerning retaliation. Um, why? Because we do find altruistic punishment and fairness, fairness concerns. Um, and that would be important for the fun punishment um, is, again, the attribution of intentions of the actor whom you're going to punish. Um, and that includes, for example, commons problems or public good problems such as environmental law. It might explain why international law works better than you would expect if you make a pure rational choice assumption. Even environmental treaties, where um, a lot of rat choice scholars have been very, um, very skeptic, skeptical about whether it could work. So again, some suggestions uh, which we might want to use. Uh, one is sort. Try to sort whether the behavior is due to the capacity or missing capacity of states or whether it's maliciousness. Um, and that's also what we find in some treaties, but not in all, but we would find that, for example, technical aid is very important in Kyoto, it's very important in the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, and has a whole chapter on it, um, and it's also quite important in the WTO. Especially, actually, if something is working in the WTO, it's, um, it's trade facilitation, and that basically means technical aid. Um, also, reporting has been viewed as not being very effective by rational choice scholars, um, but it might give the information, um, depending on how you report, also on the intentions of the state who is not complying with international law. And that basically means also that um, what has been a rather recent development, um, that you admit more NGO reports, for example, to the human rights committees, because that might give you a hint of whether that was... The non-compliance with, for example, human rights law was rather an issue of, of te technical capabilities or whether it was really ma maliciousness. And depending on that, you would retaliate or not. Reciprocity, big principle. Uh, traditionally in international law, Bruno Zimmer, he's a German judge on the International Court, um, has written on that in the 70s, uh, two big books um, in international law research uh, and in international relations research as well as in behavioral research. Funnily, it is understood a little bit differently. And the, the rational choice approach, basically what you say, if, 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 if um, um, I'm favorable to others, if others are favorable to me. But the question is why? Um, the rational choice approach would say that uh, reciprocity leads to compliance since the defector would also lose the benefits of the treaty. So it basically would do a cost-benefit analysis in the first place. Now, what would um, Bintley do? Um, it would say that reciprocity, they have a more narrow sense in a way, um, I call it reciprocity stricto sensu, uh, is often related to equality and fairness concerns. So again, intentions matter. Third thing, expressive law, 
Um, that has been one issue again in national law um, by um, behavioral law and econ scholars. And basically the issues, and that's also what you find in, in experiments, law, and I would say international law, may affect behavior by changing preferences or beliefs. Now this is a very difficult topic because that basically gives up one of the main assumption of the rational choice approach, um, stable preferences. Nevertheless, I think it is important because that would mean that um, people or states might intrinsically comply with norms. That is very close to constructivist approaches of international relations. So, and especially if you look at internal policies and the so-called norm spirals and developed by Risse, who basically goes on this internalization process. Um, so that could also be explained by um, Bintley. And that is interesting because basically by now, constructivists have done case studies assuming that there is something like that, but they don't really know. So there is no hard research behind it as we could have it um, in or from the lab and then transferring it. Um, so, but the good news is, I think that con there, it, it, Bintley might here hint us versus to, to convergence with constructivist theories and international relations. Let me conclude, and I'm actually half an hour. That's good. So we have a lot of time to discussion. I hope I wasn't too quick. Um, I think a research gap can be diagnosed. Um, this presentation really means to be a first step outlining a research agenda and saying where it could be useful to, to use um, Bintley. Um, I would still argue that the starting point of analysis should be rational choice, um, but we could and th should think about that selectively applying behavioral law and economics um, might make sense, it might contradict, or it might confirm um, um, international law and economics. But it could be go in both directions, so it could change... Um, the compliance, for example, to a plus from plus to minus, or it can do um, 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 make it more more forceful. Now, I would um, I would submit that it can, in certain instances, which we have which we have to define quite clearly, might explain the behavior of states better, and thus also may lead to better treaty design. Um, and um, I think the convergence with constructivist approaches to international law um, is a very interesting development or could be a very interesting development in the name of unity of knowledge. And here I'm quoting a book by E.O. Wilson from Harvard, who wrote a big book in 98 on the unity of knowledge, um, also in social science. Um, so I think um, it's a way or a venue, research venue, worth exploring. And um, I'm very happy that I could um, make this presentation here. And I very much look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Anna, would you like me to call, or do you want to call on whoever it is? Immediately forget your question. Uh, I'll, I'll start it. Jonathan? Thank you, Anna. That was a really um, excellent comparison of the different approaches that have been taken before and the research agenda. So I wanted to ask you about the research agenda and how you think these problems can be studied. First, it's difficult to experiment with states. So it's hard, hard to have the states come into the lab and <coughs> give them different uh, questions and treatments. But if we were instead trying to use an observational empirical approach where we look historically at how states have actually behaved, then what I want to ask about is um, how do you uh, think about the uh, detailed understanding we would need to have of the internal constitutional structure, political dynamics, uh, role of different institutions in each different state, and also how they uh, may be linked transnationally. You know, all of the literature on disaggregating the state uh, seems to me crucial here. And I'll just give one example. Uh, you mentioned at one point in the talk that uh, the behavioral law and economics approach indicates that people may be more willing to cooperate and more willing to punish 
defectors even at a cost of themselves. So that sounds like we should get more cooperation internationally. On the other hand, you mentioned the problem of endowment effect and loss aversion that concessions may look like losses, and so that might suggest less cooperation internationally. And there's a further potential problem, which is that if the state is disaggregated, then different subgroups, whether they are branches of government or factions, they may be competing with each other within the state. So uh, loss uh, to the state may actually be a loss to a rival within, within the state group. That is, one group may, may um, like to cooperate internationally in a way that imposes losses on its domestic rivals. Um, so that complicates the interpretation of what's, what is a concession or what is um, a cooperative gain or cooperative loss. So that's just one example of how the internal structure and power dynamics might be uh, very important to understanding the, the actual behavior of states. I w wonder if you could say more about how you see how we could study those problems. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. That's, of course, the most difficult question. Um, and that hints exactly at the problems with this approach. Um, and like of scaling up um, the, the psychological approaches to groups, because we would need to look at what's happening in the group. We, funnily, I mean, in the political psychology literature, I said they're basically focus, focusing on individuals, and that there are other articles. They just take the state and do the same. So they don't even make a problem out of it. Um, Levy has done so in a 92 article a little bit, but uh, not extensively, and they don't solve the problem. Now, I think what we are faced with here is clearly a, a, a complexity problem which we should be faced in any, we should be facing in any kind of um, deep explanation of state behavior. And to give you an example, um, economists taking the state as a black box, um, trying to explain why we have the WTO, they couldn't really explain it because from an economic point of view, um, you just, you don't have, tari ta you don't have tariffs. Uh, it's, it's more beneficial for a state to unilaterally have free trade. They understood, the, with the exception of big countries, because you influence terms of trade. Um, but for small countries, why? Um, now, the explanation was basically given op only by breaking up the black box state. Um, that is more complexity. So you have internal actors. You have in in internal interest groups, which are for or against um, uh, free trade. And that makes analysis already more complicated. And I, you are absolutely right. With this approach, I make it even more complicated because you have, might have biases which either go for more cooperation or against cooperation. Um, and that's very difficult to figure out. And that has been one critique which has been raised also against behavioral law and economics as such. Because we don't really, I mean, the idea of Substituting, this is why I said we, I think we should stay with rational choice as a starting point. The idea of substituting the rational choice assumption by a different behavioral theory is impossible because the biases hint in this or that direction. So I think the only way to conclude that, the only way of going forward is to be very precise on your research question look at what kind of actors nationally are involved, and look at the procedures. What can I tell you? If you ask, I asked once the, um, um, the, what, the research head of the, of the British Central Bank, whether they behind, I mean, given that we have behavioral finance, if they built their models, and you know about the research, you build it in your models, he said, are you crazy? It's not too complicated. You can't, you can't calculate it. So, so that is making it more difficult. Concerning methodology, that would mean that you probably need to go away a little bit more from hardcore modeling, um, more to uh, certain case studies. And I would appreciate, for example, the historical approach. Even though, speaking as an economist, um, I love the rigorous research of economists. But I think in, in those kind of issues, we need to explore it a little bit more and see whether it works. But I think there are many PhDs in here. <laughs>
Secretary? Well, I would certainly encourage you to keep going. Because, uh, of course, for me, I think that the rational choice model always generates more problems than it solves. And even if you can't answer all your questions with uh, false rigor, at least by asking the right questions, I think you're likely to get better results in the long run. Um, I think one point where I thought you overestimated the capacity of your approach was in that fact-finding. Mm -hmm. I don't see the international system so far being very good at fact-finding at all. Uh, cases in my area, intellectual property, the WTO was terrible. And uh, even when we get a fact commission, usually can we trust it? Usually we don't trust it. It's political. What are these people going to say in Syria? Are they going to be seeing the right things? Um, and, and, and I remember the one time we actually had an honest fact finder on uh, weapons of mass destruction, we all said, oh, he was wrong, right? We didn't want to destroy. So I, I'm really, really very suspicious about it. I think we ought to build, build in some more, uh, um, to more work on that element, because it could be crucial to your, your whole operation. Absolutely. I, I agree. I think the fact finding issue concerning all those sorts of intentions, which I, and that plays a big role, obviously. Um, there, the fact-finding is quite important. And I think fact-finding has, um, I mean, if, if it's true that, that the intentions play such a role, um, then fact-finding has been underrated in the literature as well, because we don't attribute a lot of importance to it. You know, we do it, but it's not prominent. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we don't have it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, you're right. I mean, the international system is not very good at it, and we might have to think to make it better. Yeah. Any, I Thank you. Before I turn to other Kelly, any students would like to? So just a clarificatory question. What's, what are the, con what's the constructivist approach to international law? Like, what's so bad about it? It seems like there's something bad about it, which is why it's... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I really don't yeah. know anything about it. <laughs> right. Look, um, I'm framed. Um, and my frame is, is an economist's frame. And I guess, like in my economic, how would you say this, mother milk, um, there is critical rationalism inside. Uh, research is about testable hypothesis. Um, and economists are, I mean, that's their Bible. It really is. And it has been my Bible. And I can tell you, I've, I've, I've come quite a long way. I've come quite a long way. I was um, more, much, I mean, I was never a hard, hardcore rap choice, but, um, but um, I think I was much more critical. I'm less critical now. Um, the issue is that constructivist approaches, again, um, now are trying to do more empirics. Um, but that's a recent development. And I think they're doing incredibly good work. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy for that. But 20 years ago, um, that was basically, okay, we have an idea that um, people act because they have some norms and beliefs which they internalize, but you couldn't test it. So this is why I might have sounded critical, but I've, I've, as, as you have seen, you know, I would, I would very, in the, in the interest of unity of knowledge, I, was very, I would very much appreciate those approaches coming together. And, and I need to say, and that's a caveat, um, a lot of it, a lot of the discussion has been really in international relations, if I talk to my political science colleagues, they have always like a clear, or used to have a clear uh, stamp on their face. I'm a rat choicer, I'm a constructivist. And they were battling each other. I, I think that is also becoming much better. And I, again, much appreciate that. So sorry if I sound, sounded too critical. I, I just um, probably, it's because I'm, I'm coming from one side. I appreciate the convergence. But um, so, so could you give a contemporary example of constructivist approach to international law that you find reasonable? Like, you know, just clarify for I really don't understand what it is. Well, uh, so you say there's a convergence. So like, what's the other side? What's the constructivist approach that is converging with your approach? Well, I, I, I would say um, if you do, once you try to do empirical research um, and you try to have testable hypothesis, I'm fine with it. That's why I'm saying 
Um, the rare choice approach is I mean, basically I mean, about. Can you quickly explain what you what what, what we mean by constructive in international more, relations? More I think it's a question. Is ah. What is it? Just what is the approach? Okay, it's basically it's basically it's sorry sorry um, it, it's basically I mean to put it very simply to put to put it to put it very very simply it's basically that you attribute behavior to perceptions of reality, and that is and 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 you you you. Preferences are not stable um, as in rat choice, but they change, um, and they change due to I ideas, um, uh, ideologies, values, and, and this is somehow always in flux. Now, from a from a critical rationalist perspective, do, do you understand a little bit? So, so the norm exactly. spiral of Thomas Risse, for example, would say states comply with human rights law because at one end it's a spiral and how it influences the leaders and the people, and um, uh, but but it it influences also via a change of preference. It's like a non-empirical methodology, and that's what you find distasteful. It about. used to be. It used to be. I think that is that has changed now. So you have, you do have jackal or die. They do empirical work, um, which I think is 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 is, is very good. Um, also on, for example, courts behavior. So so there is there is more things, and it's not that they wouldn't have um, they wouldn't have done empirical work before. They did case studies, but case studies are from an economic rigorous point of view, um, even though now I'm saying we should probably do more case studies, um, if you ask about the methodology of research, it's qualitative, it's not quantitative, and it's, um, it's not as rigorous, probably, because you can't control. And again, the problem, I think the main problem uh, which economists have with this kind of approach is that if you have stable preferences, um, so you want to explain behavior, and you have two variables. You have your stable preference that's given, and the change, the external change, um, is basically a change in restrictions or prices which are given for your behavior. Okay? Um, so the change in behavior, you can clearly attribute it to a change in restrictions. But if both of it is in flux, the preferences as well as the restrictions, you don't know where to attribute the change of behavior. That's a problem. That, that is a classical problem of, of, of why we always had held the preferences stable. And if you talk to economists, I mean, they or red choices, they wouldn't say preferences are necessarily stable. We know they're changing, but they're changing much more slowly than restrictions. So for methodological reasons, we hold them constant. Um, thanks. That's an amazing, uh, it's, a, it's a very large program that you have. I also have a question that builds on Jonathan's actually, on the question to what extent we can translate insights that are really insights from psychology, and that means human psychology, uh, to the behavior, behavior of states. You say the problem is one of groups instead of individuals, and group psychology is more complex than individual psychology. It seems to me in international law, in some areas, we certainly have that treaty negotiations where experts come together and build a certain type of common enterprise and tend to be overly optimistic in the framing of their, of their treaties. That could be something where individual psychology can really help, or even group psychology. But the main problem, it seems to me, in the behavior of states does not come from them being groups or even being very large groups, but from them being constituted in a very particular way, much of which, which is a, uh, depends on domestic law, constitutional law, um, separation of powers, um, election campaigns, um, periods in office, limits of office, etc., etc., all of which transpire onto what then becomes the conduct of the state, which is really an agency issue, right? You have an agent speaking out for the state, but that agent is responsible towards the rest of the state. So I wonder, wouldn't a behavior, Bintley, it sounds very Swiss, sounds very nice. Um, <laughs> that sounds like one of these small things that you find somewhere in the mountains, right? Look, I brought this Bintley back from my mountain hike. Um, or, or that, yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't we want to 
uh, try to, if we want to simplify it, we don't want all that complexity in our analysis because it's just, it's not, it's, it's just literally impossible. Wouldn't we want a behavioral theory of states that is not psychological, at least not psychological in the same way as individual psychology because when we observe how states act, we tend to make this mistake of anthropomorphism, of treating them as individuals, but we know they really are. And we know things like endowment effect translate very, very imperfectly on, 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 on states because well, we don't, we don't have individual psychology. We have observable behavior. We have continuities, reciprocities, reputations, et cetera, et cetera. But wouldn't we want a model that is not kind of copied from individual psychology as it underlies domestic law, behavioral law, and economics, and instead come up with something that's also complex, a different behavioral theory of states? Thank you, Michael. Um, it indeed comes back to the problem of complexity. And I, what I, I don't want to say, and this is why I'm saying, I don't, want to, I don't want to leave out institutions. And you're completely right. I mean, every behavior of a government is always constrained by certain institutions, and those institutions may even differ between states. So it could be that, for example, to put it very bluntly, uh, that a dictator behaves differently than... Uh, a presidential system which behaves differently from a parliamentary system. So that could well be true. Um, I don't know. Well, we're I, pretty I, sure that the United States behaves differently in international law in part because of a uh, specific constitutional way in which we make international law vis-a-vis -vis other countries. Sure. I mean, you could say, well, I mean, the U.S. Um, is having this big elephant in the room, which is called the Senate, which never ratifies the treaties everybody else is ratifying. Sure. <laughs> Um, and I wouldn't need Bintley for that, um, the little Swiss bint, um, <laughs> yeah. little chocolate. Um, no, I wouldn't need that for it. You're, you're completely right. Um, and we could have done this with a rat choice approach already without any problems. Um, the thing is that, again, I mean, if you look at national political economy, and there is some research on this kind of interaction um, done between behavior of states and the national institutions by political scientists. But it's, again, it's not, it's not very fine-grained, but maybe that's good enough for a first step. It does complicate the analysis, of course. But, but I think you're right. And I, I, thanks for the question, because I did not mean to leave out the institutions. I think they are important. It just complicates matters even more. And as you see, you know, my caveat is really my biggest problem, this jump from individual psychology to behavior of states. But take the endowment effect. Um, the endowment effect is an effect which we do not find, and they have done experiments on that, um, where individuals were supposed to act as a manager of... So there's some research in corporate, corporate actors, um, firms, basically. Um, and so you, what you play in the lab is you're a manager of um, a company which you don't own, you don't show the endowment effect, uh, whereas you do show it if you own your company. Okay. Now, how's it with states? Look at territorial disputes. I think there's almost nothing, which it doesn't matter how, how much you hate your government, but I have not ever seen a state which is, uh, um, in the, including the population, if you cede territory, you're dead as a politician. And it doesn't matter whether it's Serbia and Kosovo or whether it's Chile and Peru, uh, it's, it's everywhere. It's interesting, and that is public opinion. So they do show the endowment effect, funnily. So, I, I mean, if you look at opinion pollings in those, in the, now the question is how much does this influence state behavior? If you look at Serbia and Kosovo, we are optimistic now that that's gonna be peaceful, but um, you know, you find some other ways around and stuff like that. But uh, I think it's there. So, but I think, I, I think again, I mean, territorial disputes would be an interesting issue to look at, for example, how it plays out. Any other student questions? I think. So, Chris, when you're, when you're mentioning the classical endowment effect of public opinion, one of my immediate reactions to that as, I guess, a historian of some sort is that, in many ways, the, seeing a, an, an endowment effect towards territory is completely non-surprising for modern nation states because you have the ideology of some kind of border-based nationalism. Right? So it's, a it's not so much a natural endowment effect that has 
kind of implicit psychological groundings in human psychology, it's much more an ideological construct of history in which you, I mean, if you go back to say old dynastic states, conceding territory was basically part of the course. Everyone did it regularly and without much public opinion consequences. It's, it's only with the rise of a nation state, with the rise of nationalism, that you start having this kind of public opinion and dominant effect towards territory. Um, so I just wonder, w wondered whether you had any thoughts about that possibility. I think it's intertwined. Um, um, what can I say? It's probably like with religion. Um, you know, there is a there is a history. You have a belief. Um, it's played upon by politicians as well. Um, and I think you do the same thing with history. And I, you all guys, you don't remember that, but um, in 1990, when the when the wall fell down um, in Europe, um, there was a lot of fear that states. Um, and that's actually what they did. They rewrote the history books. Romania and Bulgaria, for example, certain territories. That was ours because we found a helmet which is a 1,000 years old, and they belong to the Romans, so the, you know, it's not to you, Bulgaria. It's ours, Romania. So things like that, and you play on this kind of historical ideology, national, nationalism. But the question is why you can do it as a politician, or why, why media can do it. Why is it so forceful? And I think that it could well be that it's an endowment effect and it might play because you have some kind of identification with your country. And, and that is interesting because if a manager, for example, doesn't have this kind of identification with its, his firm, um, it might not play. But if he does have it, it depends how you, how, how you frame the questions in the lab, if, if you find a different effect, um, if, if, if you have some kind of... Uh, um, identification process of a non-owning manager um, or, I mean, I don't know, shares which you give to managers are probably done so that they have some kind of <laughs> de facto identification with their firm. Um, so, can I follow up on that? So, so, so what, 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 what was really intriguing to me was that you, you see this territorial effect in modern nation states. If you think back to, say, like the old feudal system, where basically, according to a lot of political scientists, pre-1700 or pre-1750, states were selling off pieces of property as matters of you know, parts of marriage agreements, parts of inheritance agreements. They could do that with complete impunity. And the, 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 the sold-off population simply wouldn't care. Whether, whether you're, you're under the purview of one lord versus another, it just didn't matter to them. Right? And I, I think you uh, pick up on you, uh, that still might actually, there still might actually be some endowment in there. But it's simply that nationalism kind of redefined our concept of what is ours. Yes. And it's not that the endowment effect just all, all of a sudden emerged out of nowhere in, in 1800. It's probably just our concept of what, it, what actually constitutes our... I, I, I agree. I agree. I just still think... I completely agree with you. Um, I just think that the, 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 meta, the point which matters is probably... Um, the entity with which you identify, and in feudal systems, you did not, you identified with your, I only know the word in German, maybe you know it in English, Scholle. A piece of land, I'm not sure. Yeah, well, it's like this little piece of land which you basically, build, you know, do your agriculture on. Um, but, but you would not, um, since there was no nation, no, no notion of nation state, um, the allegiance was to persons not to the land. It's a very so, constructivist conversation right now. Absolutely. Yeah. No, absolutely. This is evidence for testing the absolutely. behavioral yeah. uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. hypothesis yeah. about yeah. changing identity and, and structural power. Yes, yes. yes. absolutely. absolutely. So right. Thank you. We're, well, unfortunately, we are about out of time. But please, again, join me in thanking Anna Van Aken. <laughs>